So, uh, notice I am not starting this one out with yawn. And that's that I just finished another cup of coffee and I am feeling awesome. So, uh, let's go ahead and just kind of rock the rest of this out here. And what we're more or less kind of nearing the end of this, maybe for more for your sake than mine. Um, but the, the last two things we really have left to do here is, um, I, we want to adapt our theory of probability over, uh, sorry, over discrete variables to now describe what it means to have a probability, uh, a probability function over continuous variables. So as we can see, I've drawn some arbitrary function that is defined for all x, not just for certain specific values of x. And we want to see how, what adaptations we need to make to everything we've already just done because we have more or less laid all the groundwork. Um, but at, at this point here, we basically just want to see what, what changes we can make to describe this properly as the probability for any arbitrary x, not just for certain specific values that we can handpick. And um, like I said, most of everything we've already done uh, in, the, in the previous segment will completely apply, but basically this is going to kind of just be a chore, now number one, of you know, turning summations into integrals, uh, as you could probably guess. But number two, the, the interpreting what that means is a little bit trickier, so I'll try to give some insight into that. Um, and then once we're finished this with, with this, we're basically there for describing at least what the Schrodinger equation is, kind of. Uh, we'll have to get into a lot more detail as we go further with that later. So first of all, um, oh, and by the way, <laughs> it is 3.57 a.m. I'm just decided, I decided I'm going to sleep tonight, so whatever. I am cool with that. So, uh, we have a function here that we can describe as f of x. Now, there's a couple important things that f of x has to obey for it to be properly considered, or, or at least turned into a probability function. Now, number one, and, and these are just describing what we, what physicists tend to call a well-behaved function. Um, it, I think mathematicians don't really like that terminology. It's kind of like saying that's a well-behaved kid. Okay, so what do they behave well at, you know? Um, but as physicists, we're allowed to say this, but precisely, let's put this into words. Now, number one, this function has to, um, it has to be at all points non-negative, and it also has to be defined on, or it has to take on real values. So specifically, we do not allow this to be, um, uh, well, imaginary, specifically. Um, so, so basically, it has to be a positive value or a zero everywhere. Se excuse me, second, at negative infinity and at positive infinity, it has to converge to zero in a strictly mathematical sense. And not only does it have to converge to zero at the endpoints, um, it also may not be infinitely, uh, it may not be infinite at any point anywhere. Um, so f of x specifically may not be infinite. And um, this is, by the way, what we call, if it meets this criterion here, where it converges to zero and it's not infinite anywhere, this is what we call normalizable. And that's a really important thing to, to make sure that our function is, in fact, normalizable. If not, it's to, it, it simply can't be what we consider a probability function. And then number three, um, this point here is we can actually, there's ways of kind of getting around it. So this is the least hard and fast rule, um, but it's, it, we need to throw it out there anyway. It must be continuous. So uh, we, we can avoid certain types of discontinuities. Um, and so specifically, we will actually find some examples where um, we, we can have a function that starts at zero and it leaps up to like, you know, a half and it drops down to zero discontinuously. Um, in theory, that would rule it out from uh, criterion three. But the, the way that as physicists we get around it is that instead of saying there's a discontinuous jump, we just say that there is a continuous jump over a uh, 
infinitesimally small range. So at whatever point it jumps, we just kind of smooth it out over a, a tiny little range, and then we call it continuous. Um, but specifically, the functions that we are avoiding by this are now consider this, and and this is a hilarious counterexample that you know if you ever want to test your your calculus professor or something, give them this counterexample: a function x such that it is equal to one everywhere that x is a rational number and it equals zero everywhere where x is not a rational number. <laughs> and if you go on to take a, a class in mathematical analysis, what you find is that the real numbers, which again x is defined on all the real numbers, um, the 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 you can say it two ways. Um, the rationals are what we call dense in the reals, meaning that for every two non-real numbers on the real line, you can always find a rational between them. And for every two rationals on the real line, you can find a non-rational number between them, um, irrational number. So what, what this function looks like, it looks like 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And the more you zoom in, there's, the, there's more and more of these completely discon discontinuous jumps. And it's infinitely discontinuous. Um, it's just, it, it's a crazy, bizarre function. And this is the type of function that we have to specifically avoid. So, by the way, just, it, it's one of those things that, like, it doesn't seem to make sense, but on, you know, a, a precisely mathematical you know, definition-wise, it, it is actually a meaningful function. And the crazy thing is there are ways to actually show that you can, in fact, integrate that function. Um, it's called measure theory. You have to you employ, you employ measure theory for what's called the Lebesgue integral. Now, this is stuff that um, if you're a math major, eventually you hear about this. If you're a physics major, you'll never hear nor care about this. So whatever. Um, but anyway, all that's a bit of an aside. But the point is, though, from here on out, we're going to assume that any function that we're dealing with is well-behaved, meaning that it meets these three criterion and at least meets three softly. So, given that, let's talk about what it means for this function to be considered or interpreted as a probability function. And um, the first thing, we're going to ask question one. Is, this is, this is a whole new set here, um, so maybe I won't start it at one, but we're going to ask the question now. Is, uh, not f of x, but is the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of f of x dx equal to 1? Now, if the answer is yes, it's easy. Because this is what we what we say is it's already normalized. And that gets back to this thing here. So if that is true, then all we're going to do is we're just simply going to put, we're going to define a new function rho. It's the curly P, but it's the Greek letter rho of x, exactly equal to our function f of x. So we're just given a different name, but making no changes. If no, then we have to do a little bit of work, but it's still pretty easy. All we're going to do now is say that rho of x equals, and the, the term that I'm going to use here is we are going to normalize it, and not just we're accepting that it's weird, uh, we're normalizing it in the mathematical sense. So if no, we're going to set rho of x equal to we're going to take our function here, f of x, so it's the same value except we're going to scale it down. And specifically, we want to smush it down ow, by exactly the amount of, we're going to divide it by exactly whatever that integral is. And I'm going to write it like this, f of x prime, it's just the dummy variable, dx prime. So let's say that this integral wasn't equal to 1, it was equal to 2. All that means that this function here is twice as high as it really should be, so every point we're just going to scale it down by a factor of 2. 
Now, the other possibility is that it might be the case that this function is way too low, that the integral across all values might only be like one one thousandth. In that case, we just multiply the whole function by a thousand. Either way, though, it's exactly the same up to a multiplying factor. And the point is now we have what's called a normalized function. And by that, what we mean precisely here, um, the mathematical definition of that is that um, oops, when you take, in either of those cases here, now when you take the integral over, over all allowed values of rho of x dx, it equals 1. And if you think about probability, that's a good thing. Just, you know, put it back in terms of the discrete variables. If you have, you know, three options, you know, it's cloudy, it's, it's snowy, or it's clear, there's going to be a finite probability for each. When you add them up, it has to equal one, meaning that we have weather. It might be rainy weather, it might be snowy weather, it might be clear weather, but no matter what, you're guaranteed that one of those three outcomes will occur. And that's exactly what this statement now means, that if you add up all of the possibilities across all possible values, or you add the, the weight of all things ac across all possible values, you get out a unity answer. So from here on out, we are going to assume all of these things are met, and we have now normalized our function, and we're calling it rho of x. And by the way, get used to calling it rho of x. Don't call it p of x. So let's talk about what that function means here. And to do so, I'm going to get rid of this set. So one more thing to add about that, by the way. When we say this normalized, um, what that looks like is that if we draw this out, and I mean, as, as you know at this point, you know what an integral is, but let's draw that function out now, and it looked exactly like our function f of x did before, except maybe scale. So again, we'll just call that rho of x. And now at this point, what it means to be normalized is that if you take that integral across all values of x, so if you're adding up the whole area, that entire area here simply just equals 1. So, given that, let's consider specifically what this term now means, the integrand, uh, along with the dx there. So, rho of x is what we're officially going to call the probability density function. And by that, what we mean is we're going to take that same function here, and there's some area, and I'm going to look at some specific value of x. And I'm going to also consider some very small, narrow width dx. So at this point here, if this function is rho of x, and we're looking at some infinitesimally small width dx, we can consider this little, again, infinitesimally small area there, rho of x dx is some amount of area. Now, now imagine for a moment that we're talking finite areas. Now, the, the reality is, again, with calculus, we know that we're going to take the limit as dx approaches zero, but imagine that it's not for now. So what that means now is that this thing here, the amount of area we have just shaded, is actually going to be the percent of the entire area contained between, uh, contained within dx of x. Um, that, that's maybe not the best way of saying that, so you could otherwise think of it as um, the area between x and x plus dx, taken as kind of a, a vertical uh, slice. So if we think about it here, we've just calculated a small amount of area. We know the entire area is equal to 1. So 
if we're thinking about this as how much area compared with the entire thing, that's exactly what we call a probability. This now takes on the same function as we had um, big P of whatever our variable is J previously. So this is the probability of, uh, I, I, I want to give a little bit of physical meaning here. I, I'm going to jump ahead and then I'll, I'll, I'll jump backwards. But the probability of finding or measuring something, uh, probability of measuring, we'll say, a result between x and x plus dx. So let's step back, like I had said, and let's, let's consider what we're actually measuring, just, just to give a little bit of physical intuition, because we don't need to think about in terms of, you know, arbitrary functions and abstract things. Let's just say that at some time, at some time zero, you release a B from your hand. And at, at some later time, it can be like a second later, it can be years later, and imagine the B will live forever. Um, the B has, for whatever reason, um, it, it can only move left and right. So you have some variable X that can measure the current position of that B. And now, what, what, what we're talking about here is if this function rho of X describes the probability of where that B is, all we're saying is if you look in a small segment of width DX, how likely are you to find that B within that width DX at that current position? I, I hope that makes sense. It's basically saying if you chose any random distance from where you released it, how likely is that B to be at exactly that distance within a very small percentage? So it really is the same thing as thinking about our, our overall probability. Because if you think of these as, if you chunk this into finite segments, and consider each of those discrete possibilities, then it behaves exactly how we had before. The sum of all those finite segments will be the same as summing over all of the possible results. And because we have already normalized this function, we know that there is a, a, a likelihood of one of that B being in one of those finite segments. So again, this probability rho of x times dx is strictly just the fraction of the area in that little shaded part compared with the whole thing. And again, that's precisely what it means to be a probability. So let's actually now think about it in terms of um, uh, infinitesimal dx's. So what we're going to do now is say that the probability of looking at some finite segment between a A and a B here that are finite distances apart. And I'll call it this. The probability of finding that B between two finite points, A and B, is now simply found by adding up all of the possible small, infinitesimally small segments within that interval or treating it in calculus terms, simply integrating from A to B of that probability density function, dx. Again, if, it, if it's helpful, think of these as finite width things of which there are finitely many, and we're just adding those different possibilities that would contain it between A and B here. So this kind of gets us back our measure of, of you know, we're halfway between a, a discrete and a contiguous variable if we break it up into different chunks, A and B, finite width the part. But this is now the way we calculate probabilities on finite scales of continuous variables. So, given that, we're now going to look at what some of our actual measurable statistical uh, functions can be. And by 
measurable statistical functions. I mean, you know, the things that we've already described in terms of discrete variables, such as the expectation value or the variance. I think it's like that for you guys. Um, and also, I just wanted to write down here, this is the probability of finding or measuring the result to be between A and B. 